So when we talk about maternal health, you know, it's it's almost shocking how dramatic of a problem this is in our in our country. And it's not just a women's issue, it's a human issue. According to the CDC, that more than 60% of pregnancy-related deaths are in America are preventable. Pop Health Week is brought to you by Health Innovation Media. Health Innovation Media brings your brand narrative alive via digitally curated content for omni-channel distribution and engagement. Connect with us at www.popupstudio.productions. Welcome everyone, I'm Greg Masters, Managing Director of Health Innovation Media and the producer and co-host of Pop Health Week. Joining me in the virtual studio is my partner, colleague, and lead co-host of Pop Health Week, Fred Goldstein, President of Accountable Health, LLC. On today's show, our guest is Denise Hines, who holds a doctorate in health administration, is a certified project management professional, and admitted fellow of the Healthcare Information Management System Society, who serves as the HIMSS Chief America's Officer. Dr. Hines is an award-winning, nationally recognized expert in healthcare technology. She has more than two decades of healthcare experience in a variety of settings, including health systems, physician offices, home health, technology vendors, consulting, state government, and revenue management. Dr. Hines was named Chief America's Officer for the Health Information and Management Systems Society, or HIMSS, in January of 2019. She has been a member of the HIMSS Board of Directors and is the Chair Emeritus for HIMSS North America Board of Directors. Dr. Hines has been instrumental in advancing healthcare connectivity in Georgia, ensuring physicians have the information they need to deliver quality care. Through her work at the local, state, and regional level, Dr. Hines has improved technology adoption and advanced its exchange. So, Fred, with that introduction, over to you. Help us get to know Dr. Hines. Thanks so much, Greg and Denise. Welcome to Pop Health Week. Well, thank you, Fred. Yeah, it's a pleasure to have you on. You've got a really extensive background across a lot of areas of IT and interconnectivity. I'd love for you to give our audience a sense of some of your prior work and what you're doing now. Sure. Well, you know, Fred, I hate to admit it, but I've been in this space for about 30 years now, Um which is amazing when I think about my career. My entire career has been focused on uh, healthcare, health information and technology, um, really working to design systems and doing implementation, supporting technology, working with vendors, health systems. I love to work on HIT policy funding opportunities. I've worked on HIPAA, worked on directly with providers to help them with their technology adoption and implementation. So what I think my most favorite space in this industry is working with outreach and education, helping providers to understand the value of HIT. I think when I think over my years, I've probably attended almost every medical specialty association to meet providers where they are, to talk to them about the value of health IT, and even going on site to meet with them to help them understand how to use systems and uh, submit quality data to federal agencies, accessing funding as well to support their work, and then leading um, health information exchanges, data extraction, so all for the purposes of improving health outcomes. So I live at that sector of policy, technology, and funding. But now, Fred, I think I'm at a point in my career where I really want to consider using my platform or continue using my platform really to help solve some of those complex healthcare problems, including diversity and inclusion and uh, health equity issues for underserved communities and underrepresented populations. So all that in a nutshell is my couple of minutes still about my 30-year career. I really do want to get into the issues around health equity and things like that and yeah. particularly the applicability mm-hmm. of IT to it. But before that, could you talk a little bit about, about your work with Georgia's HIE and what that is and how that works? Mm-hmm. Sure. In Georgia, uh, we have a statewide health information exchange, and my role is to serve as the executive director. In that role, we are an award-winning health information exchange, and we have all types of providers and users on the network to exchange health information. And we were, in Georgia, one of the first statewide exchanges to take advantage of the national network, the eHealth Exchange, by exchanging with uh, bordering states 
So we, we are, we're an award-winning health information exchange network, and my role has been to work with providers across the state to get them to connect to the to the network, but also teaching them, again, the value of exchanging information and making it available to get out of these silos of um, data sitting uh, to be used for health purposes. So that's yeah. that's and, what I've been doing in that role. And how many providers and systems are in that network? Uh, we have over 13,000 plus providers across the state, including state agencies. For example, the Medicaid agency is a participant, public health, the state foster care agency is a participant. So we've been working with several of the state agencies around contributing data for public health purposes, such as the registry. I think one of our proudest moments here with the statewide exchange is our ability to provide alerts to the Department of Child, Family and Children Services to alert them when one of the children in their care in the Georgia Family 360s program, one of, when one of the children in their care presents to a health system, we can alert them that they need to reach out to the health system and, and, and check on that child. So we've been instrumental in providing what we like to call value-added services beyond basic health exchange that help to improve communication and data flow, not only between providers, but among providers, state agencies, ambulances are connected to the network, um, just all types of school clinics. We were able to um, help um, get connected and help exchange um, information. So we've had, um, I would say, great success at talking about the value of health information exchange, but there's still a lot of work to be done. So we're still mm-hmm. pushing forward there. Well, it's fantastic to hear about that concept and what you actually put in place of notification to the Department of Children and Family Services. That's a great sort of as you add another value add to what's typically, oh, we're going to exchange a bunch of healthcare information between people. But that's really sort of stepping outside the box a bit from the healthcare system and, and mm-hmm. coming up with a unique mm-hmm. concept. Are there others you've seen like that or similar areas you're looking at doing things similar to that between various organizations? I've talked a little bit about our query-based exchange, but I think our role with using direct messaging or secure messaging has been um, impressive as well. Uh, We were one of the early users of secure messaging, and where we found the need is we're we're always going to see some providers who may not adopt the advanced EHR system who are still faxing. So we can go and offer uh, secure messaging solutions to long-term care facilities who traditionally at this point have not adopted those systems to participate in health information exchange. So we can get them on uh, secure messaging and they can exchange information or submit information to a public health agency in ways that they would not have been able to waiting on an EHR implementation. We've implemented pharmacies ambulances, and all of those segments of healthcare that we wouldn't traditionally think would have access to participate in health information exchange. So I learned early on, even in my, throughout my career, the best way that we're going to be successful at exchanging health information is to find solutions that meet providers where they are to bring them into the fold. So we've been very successful at that here in Georgia, too. So you've gone from the children's to seniors, <laughs> in effect. And does that include uh, skilled nursing facilities as well or as part of that messaging exchange system? Yes, we have. We've exchanged over, I think, uh, I should have checked my numbers before we got on this call, <laughs> but over a million messages uh, last year, and we are headed toward that goal again. But what we found is we can find healthcare providers who are still faxing we can get them on secure messaging within days and help them understand how to use it. And once they're on, they're on. And they now can exchange within their referral patterns. They can exchange with the large health systems who have secure messaging. And then we can also work with um, healthcare providers who have advanced EHR, who also are regional exchanges in their own rights where they have connected health systems and hospitals and their own physician practices. So we've connected those large regional exchanges as well. So now you have the, what we call the, um, I like to call the last mile providers who seem to have been forgotten in some of the regulatory um, support early on. 
so we can now offer them solutions, but also the most sophisticated advanced health systems can um, also exchange within the uh, statewide exchange. So that's been our goal, meet providers where they are, bring them into the fold and help them electronically exchange information to make sure the data gets where it needs to go. What's been the response from the providers to this as they've connected up? What's been the feedback you received from them? Um, I, I, most providers, or I would say early on, because the statewide exchange, we've been up uh, for a while now. We've been uh, successful uh, with maintaining the statewide exchange, growing it, and uh, remaining relevant, which is, you know, has been a challenge, I would say, in the HIE space for some organizations. Um, the response initially, uh, we have, of course, you know, you look at the technology adoption um, cycle where you have those who are sitting at the table waiting on us to, um, you know, create a statewide exchange to allow them to exchange because they understand the value of it. And then you have those in the middle. If you show them the value, they will connect. And then you still have those that on the other side who still want to hold on to their data who haven't necessarily embraced releasing it for reasons of competition, for they're not certain where their data is going, uh, privacy and security issues, concerns. So we work to make sure that we understand what those concerns are and create solutions, answers, whatever supporting documents we need or information we need, we, we seek that. But there are still organizations who are not comfortable, still not comfortable exchanging their information and uh, with others outside of their their health system. So hopefully we'll get there. And I know we have some new new leadership and policies and organizations who are very supportive of HIEs that uh, we'll continue to work work with and and uh, take advantage of those opportunities. Yeah, early on, you mentioned registries and connecting registries up for this. And obviously, you know, population health. Do, is built on data. It doesn't exist without data mm-hmm. flowing through the system and then doing all of the other services you need to do to improve the health of populations. What sorts of registries are you seeing on the system and, and how are they being used? Yeah, so uh, when we talk about population health, you know, it's really going to be based on data. The best systems will require good data, um, data transformed into the right information. So I, my personal opinion about what can be done with technology and population health is that technology and interoperability can be that equalizer to if it is designed and implemented and administered and used appropriately. So I think if we do um, IT and interoperability the right way, meaning whether we're using an information exchange to move data, if we do it the right way and we have all providers or and stakeholders who are participating in a patient's care contributing and 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 moving the data, then we could um, have data um, exchanged in the right way completely, the right information on the right patient at the right time for the right pri- provider for the right treatment and the right care plan. So what we're learning in the HIE space is we have to design to be able to move all types of information to have the right information, whether it's medication information, whether it's a care plan, whether it's uh, dis- it's discharge information, admissions and discharge transfer information. So a, a health information exchange has to be that place that can create these standards and, again, meet those providers where they are. So when it comes to registries and population health, of course, COVID is the most current registry that we've heard of that's being created as we speak every day from testing information to vaccination information to contact tracing. So creating that registry and being ready to create a registry as quickly as as was needed with COVID is going to be truly the test of an HIE but also the registry of immunization information. We look at birth defects information, a newborn registry. And there are other registries such as tumor registry, cancer registry, so every diabetes registry, so every type of chronic condition or disease state has a registry. Mm -hmm. And depending on the sophistication of the public health agency or the health information exchange, we can get registries up and going and using the data 
that comes from a provider. We can take a data feed and scrub it, but I, what I call scrub or parse it out and contribute to those registries so that the public health agencies have, they will have complete information from a provider. But the important part about that, Fred, is that we don't continue to burden these providers by adding a registry every month, which is what we're seeing in the industry. So that's why the importance of an HIE exists. And if you're just tuning in to Pop Health Week, our guest is Dr. Denise Hines, Chief Americas Officer for the Healthcare Information Management System Society, also known as HIMSS. Absolutely. That's great, Denise. And the other area you talked about early was, and obviously you've done a lot of thinking and work in this area, is this whole thing of disparities. And mm-hmm. you mentioned earlier, you know, certain providers may not want to connect. They may not be associated with a big system, things like that. Sometimes I hear that and think, rural, you know, individual providers, mm-hmm. but tend to be the mm-hmm. providers that are servicing the communities we talk about where the health disparities yep. are the highest. Is that mm-hmm. the case? And how do you see uh, HIEs and others beginning to handle that problem? Yeah, I mean, um, and, and the big problem is when we think about um, health disparities and trying to address them, if you have big gaps in the data, you can never really do the right analysis on the data to begin to create solutions that can address them. So what we're seeing is if we don't have the information for, let's say there's someone who has a chronic disease and they've had it for a length of time. And if they're, all of their healthcare providers have the information they needed, then we wouldn't have to be reliant upon a patient's memory to talk about their healthcare journey, including what, what services that they receive or what, what physicians that they visit or what medications that they take. So we do know that some communities, such as rural health communities and underserved populations may not, underserved communities may not have access to um, healthcare services. So over the last couple of, I would say more importantly, the last couple of years, we started hearing the terminology social determinants of health. So what that told us is if we take a look at a patient population or patient community, I like to call it, and begin to understand whether or not that patient has access to basic services that they need to be successful in their healthcare journey. So if a patient leaves a controlled um, environment such as a hospital and they're sent home, a hospital may not know what exactly will happen when that patient goes home. And Fred, when I talk about my, my journey in healthcare, I come from home healthcare started very early in undergrad, working my way in home health care. And what's unique about home health care is we go to a patient's home. So talk about really understanding a patient envi- patient's environment, driving into a community, seeing, physically seeing the patient, how are they doing, meeting the caregiver, talking to the patient and finding out they had food. Are they able to do their activities of daily living? Did they take their meds today? Do they have access to meds? Do they have transportation, power? Do they have water? What type of home do they live in? And and those are what? Social determinants of health, the same types of information we're trying to collect using systems and ask, asking patients those questions. So if we fast forward to today, <laughs> you know, hospitals are really realizing now that they have to know about a patient's home, their community, and whether or not what those social determinants are and what those responses are. So now we've taken social determinants of health and put on digital determinants of health to see if that same patient can participate in newly formed solutions in healthcare all around digital. So, <laughs> so it's, uh, it gets even more complex when we start talking about that, um, that part of the space. Absolutely. You're talking my language, too. This in-home stuff. <laughs> you may not be aware. I founded a, a chronic disease management company 20 plus years ago that was all in-home <laughs> care management. And so mm-hmm. we were looking through the shelves. Oh, my gosh. Look at all these salty foods they've got in their mm-hmm. oven. Mm-hmm. You know, things like that mm-hmm. to try to help mm-hmm. people. And you're right. It's really about mm-hmm. understanding what's going on in that in those homes. The other point you raised, which is really fascinating, and I don't know why it hadn't hit me in the head before, was... You talked about if the HIE has all of the information in it, 
then the mm -hmm. doctor can know what's going on, which also addresses another issue, which might be the health literacy issue with the patient not being able to adequately explain their current situation, their current mm -hmm. treatment, their current medications. Mm -hmm. But if it's all in there, mm -hmm. it's in the language the provider understands. That makes a ton of sense. That's right. Yeah. yeah Let's that's talk right. a little bit more about the digital divide. And you're oh, also boy. involved in okay. some policy stuff. So what do mm -hmm. we need to do to solve this digital divide we see, the disparities associated with access to these these technologies and services? Yeah. So, th this, you know, it's going to be a tough one because uh, what we've seen over the last with COVID is really that introduction of needing to have a patient participate in their healthcare experience from their home. So now we saw um, the introduction of or really the advanced use of telehealth. And we'll use that as a, a great example. I think most people can understand the use of telehealth in, in someone's home. So what we ended up doing when we introduced telehealth to most patients, because COVID said patients have to participate in, in care from their home. And in, in, most, in, in best cases, that um, can be very convenient for a patient to be able to participate in care from their home. But it also forced us to understand or ask those questions about the digital uh, availability or digital literacy of a, and digital literacy of a patient. So does that patient have access to internet? Do they have access, one, just is broadband available in their area, which is a big problem still, which is ama still amazing to me that that is such a big problem. But also, do they understand how to use the system? Do they have a camera on either their uh, laptop or phone? And if they have access to these systems, do they know how to log in and use the healthcare app or telehealth system that the provider has um, asked them to begin to use? So as we started designing the telehealth systems and asking patients to log in from their home, we have to ask those general questions. Do you have access? Do you know how to use this? Can you, does your smartphone, uh, uh, some people are using their smartphones for internet access. And if they're using it for internet access, can they also use it for the app at the same time? So we've, we've taken for granted in some cases that people can use healthcare apps in a digital space today. And then we've also highlighted the broadband problem that exists across this nation. So from a perspective, I know there's some, some work out now to try and help individuals with the cost of their broadband and things like that. And mm -hmm. it really is, you know, there's a whole redlining issue that we saw in neighborhoods and things, and it's the same with broadband. It's essentially mm -hmm. redlining a new technology, you know, and, and so these communities don't have it. And I think obviously that's a policy issue that needs to mm -hmm. come down from D.C. or the states to ensure that we get mm -hmm. this appropriate access to these communities. Another area I know you've worked on in this is is maternity, um, and uh, particularly an area I've been focused on for a while. Um, so talk a little bit about what's going on with technology, interconnectivity, and this issue of maternity, particularly high-risk maternity individuals from low, uh, different socioeconomic groups, et cetera. Sure. Well, um, in my work, uh, Fred, with the Global Health Equity Network, uh, we've been focused on maternal health. The Global Health Equity Network is something that is allows us to focus on policy, focus on um, opportunities to improve health care for underserved and underrepresented groups, but also figure out how we can apply technology to solve some of these uh, issues. So when we talk about maternal health, you know, it's, it's almost shocking how dramatic of a problem this is in our, in our country. And it's not just a women's issue, it's a human issue. So we were able to find in our research that, according to the CDC, that more than 60% of pregnancy-related deaths are in America are preventable. I mean, preventable. I'm saying that three times, preventable. It, they can be prevented. And so we also know that because there are significant racial and ethnic disparities around maternal mor morbidities and mortality, Black women are more than three to four times more likely to die from a pregnancy-related death as compared to white women. And so now we're starting to see the, the focus on maternal health, not only from a uh, technology perspective, but from a policy perspective. What we also know from 
using technology is that if we begin to collect the data, it will help us understand what these challenges are. And if we understand what the challenges are, we can create more solutions that help prevent the death and the problems related to maternal health. So what we're doing at PIMS is through the Global Health Equity Network, we've launched a global maternal health tech challenge. And that tech challenge is truly global. We started across the globe, and now we're going to award a final winner at HEMS 21 in Las Vegas. So we've asked these innovators to create solutions that can address these barriers in care coordination and behavioral health that can be implemented to improve maternal health outcomes. And so these solutions will pick up a winner in each region, and then each of those regional winners across the globe will be given an all-expense-paid trip to HEMS 21 in Las Vegas to present their solutions, and then we're going to award a, a, a final winner at HEMS 21. So this is uh, truly something that um, HEMS is committed to, that I'm committed to, that the team is committed to at this point, finally getting the attention it needs to create some solutions. It's, mm-hmm. it's really great. And, and obviously, we're looking forward to seeing you at HIMSS and getting out to HIMSS this year in Las Vegas. So I'm sorry, we sort of run out of time, but I'd love to thank you so much for being on the show. Fantastic information. Obviously, your career has spanned a huge area of health tech and IT. <laughs> so thank you again, Denise. Well, thank you for having me, Fred, and I'll be happy to come back anytime. Absolutely. We'll have to get you back on. Back to you, Greg. And thank you, Fred. That is the last word for today's broadcast. I want to thank Dr. Denise Hines, HIMSS Chief Americas Officer, for her time and very generous insights today. For more information on Dr. Hines' work at HIMSS, go to www.hims, that's H-I-M-S-S, dot O-R-G, or follow their work on Twitter via at HIMSS. And finally, if you're enjoying our work here at Pop Health Week, please subscribe to our channel on the podcast platform of your choice and do follow us on Twitter via at Pop Health Week. Bye now.